Welcome to the third week of this course on polymers. Uh, we are looking at uh, molecular arrangements and uh, the states of polymers uh, and uh, one of the important uh, aspect of uh, the solid state of polymers is related to the state of orientation. And in uh, this lecture, uh, we will look at uh, the presence of orientation in polymeric materials from the point of view of applications. And uh, we will do this by first uh, quickly reviewing uh, what is meant by orientation and what can orient. And then uh, we will look at a few examples of uh, where such oriented uh, systems are used and also uh, where we can process them. So, orientation uh, is uh, basically can be of uh, molecules, macromolecules uh, in our case. Uh, it can be the orientation of crystalline uh, segments, uh, crystalline domains of the macromolecules. Uh, if we have mixture of uh, two polymers, then uh, one polymer uh, will be distributed in another polymer. There will be domains of one polymer and another polymer. So, these can also be oriented. And uh, in composites, uh, when we add uh, short fibers or uh, when we add uh, whiskers, so then uh, these can also be oriented. So, therefore, uh, when we speak of orientation in polymeric materials, it, it can be of all these different things. Uh, in case of macromolecule, it is the chain itself uh, which is aligning in a preferred direction. And why would this happen? Uh, why would chains align in a particular direction? So, can you think of uh, if uh, you have actually experienced the alignment of chains during your day to day use of polymers? So, if you think about it, uh, when you take a grocery bag or any of the plastic films and if you start stretching, initially it will stretch easily and then as you stretch more and more, it becomes more difficult and then it will also not uh, spring back. So, in such cases, what is happening is polymer molecular chains are getting aligned. Similarly, if you have a semi-crystalline sample uh, and we have seen uh, the structure of spherulitic uh, uh, arrangement in case of uh, polymers, uh, what we have is uh, the uh, crystalline lamella which are growing in all three dimensions. And uh, so, if we try to stretch this sample, then uh, what will happen is the crystallites will also get oriented and the amorphous uh, region where, where there is between two lamella, there is of course, amorphous region. So, that also will start getting oriented. And uh, if we have a, 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 a polymer blend, then uh, what we have is let us say uh, a single a polymer 1 and then we have uh, a polymer 2 and this polymer 2 uh, is uh, distributed in uh, with uh, domains in polymer 1. So, if we stretch this sample then again these uh, blue domains will start orienting. So, therefore, uh, different uh, orientation is possible. Uh, for example, in case of a composite sample, uh, what we have is uh, if I have a, a, a geometry in which uh, polymer uh, melt is made to flow like this and uh, this polymer melt has also short fibers and uh, we will denote those sh short fibers and uh, since the flow is in this direction, the short fibers will also predominantly start getting oriented in the flow direction. So, therefore, orientation of short fibers is also possible. So, all of these uh, are different examples of orientation and uh, we can quantify uh, this orientation by uh, trying to ask uh, uh, two different questions. So, basically what we are looking at uh, is let us say if there is a chain and uh, then there is an orientation of the chain. So, we can take a point on the chain and then we can have the position vector of that point and then uh, we are asking the question as to what is the orientation of uh, this chain uh, with respect to some uh, coordinate system that is of our interest. So, let us say uh, if uh, this is one axis and let us say flow is happening in this direction z direction and so we are interested in knowing with respect to that flow direction the z direction what is the orientation. So, in that case, uh, this angle between this and uh, so this angle theta will be of uh, interest. But generally, uh, this uh, orientation can be quantified if we know the angle uh, that uh, this position vector makes, the projection that is made 
on x axis, y axis and z axis. So, if I denote this as theta z, then there will be projections on theta x, uh, x axis and theta y which is on y axis. So, this is one way of uh, quantifying. Uh, the other way of quantifying this uh, orientation is also by our usual spherical coordinate system kind of a, a description where we say that uh, the with the z axis the theta is the angle and then uh, we do the projection onto the x y plane and then the angle which is uh, related to the projection on x and y and which we usually denote by phi. So, these two different ways uh, uh, in which we can look at what is the orientation and therefore quantify what is this position vector. Now, the complication is that when we have a bulk macromolecular sample, a sheet or a molded part, what we have is lots and lots of macromolecules. So, when we say orientation, we are interested in average orientation. So, therefore, uh, the uh, quantification factors which are there, uh, one is called the orientation factor or the conformation or orientation tensor, these are necessarily average quantities which can quantify and tell us on average what is the orientation in the sample. So, for example, uh, this uh, uh, orientation factor has average of what is the cos theta for all different macromolecules. So, here uh, we already talked about that uh, theta is the angle which is made by the projection of uh, the orientation uh, vector onto the z axis. So, what we need to do is take all such macromolecular segments which are oriented in lot of different random directions. We need to take all such theta, we evaluate cos theta for all of them because that will tell us how much is the projection along z direction. For example, if the fiber is in x y plane, then its projection on z will be because theta is pi by 2 90, the projection will be 0. Of course, when the fiber is in x y plane, it is not going to project anything onto the z axis. So, similarly, if the fiber is aligned already in z direction, then its whole length will be projected. And so, therefore, this uh, curly brackets which in indicates ensemble average as we have uh, discussed earlier, this tells us what is the projection of each and every uh, uh, macromolecular segment along the direction of interest in this case which is the z direction. And as I said, this is because of the flow may be happening in z direction and we want to find out how many macromolecules or how many fibers are getting aligned in the flow direction. And uh, if you look at the definition of uh, this, uh, what happens when cos square theta is uh, 1 by 3? The average cos square theta if it is 1 by 3, then orientation factor is 0. So, this is in fact the sample where there is random orientation. Can you think why? Why is cos square theta equal to 1 by 3 implies random orientation? So, in this, this uh, we are also looking at uh, x and y being uh, uh, identical and because there is flow direction in z, z is different compared to x and y. So, if you have a random uh, orientation, then uh, we discuss that uh, there will be theta x onto x axis, theta y into y axis and theta z into z axis. And given that all the macromolecules are randomly oriented, each of them will contribute equally. And what we will have is, in that case, we will see that this average and this average, this of course always has to be 1 irrespective of any situation. But when they are randomly uh, arranged, all 3 will be equal and each of them will be 1 third. So, therefore, in that case AOF is 0. So, you can think about how justification of AOF being 1 or minus half implies. The other uh, way to co completely keep track of this is to just uh, take this orientation vector and its different components p x p y and form this orientation tensor. So, if uh, let us say all of them are organized only along z direction. So, let us say if we have all the segments and they are all like this, all the segments are like this. So, in that case we will only have p z, p x p y are 0. So, therefore, you can arrive at uh, this orientation tensor and then that will tell us what is the state of orientation. 
Now, from the practical point of view, this is used in lot of different ways. Uh, one of the most important uh, set of products which are there where orientation is mentioned in commercial names itself are biaxially oriented films. So, BOPP, polypropylene or uh, polyamides or polyethylene terephthalate. And uh, here is an example uh, from uh, Jindal group, uh, the uh, polypropylene that they make. In fact, they give their uh, tensile strengths in uh, two different values and they are also saying different directions. So, what this implies is uh, this film uh, which is made from polypropylene, it is actually being stretched, but it is stretched in two different directions. So, initially the film is stretched in this direction and once the stretching happens, then transverse direction stretching is also involved, so that the sample becomes stretched in both directions. And so, uh, this kind of uh, direction uh, stretching makes sure that uh, macromolecules get aligned in the direction of stretching. And in this case, by doing biaxial stretching, orientation is being done in both the directions. So, you can think of if we do just one single uh, uh, uniaxial orientation, then macromolecules more will be aligned in this direction. But if you do biaxial orientation, then we have orientation uh, in both the directions and therefore, the film will be stronger in both components. However, you can see that there is a difference in the two directions and in fact, uh, percentage shrinkage is also different. Percentage shrinkage here implies that if I heat the polymer film, it shrinks. Now, can you think why would that be? Why is this film which is oriented where we have forced the macromolecules to orient themselves from their random configuration? as soon as we heat them, there is a shrinkage. And so, effectively what you have to think of is why does this oriented sample want to go back to shrinkage. And if you can think in terms of molecular flexibility, whenever thermal energy is available, you have got the answer. So, we will discuss this more later on in the course. So, this orientation is very crucial in terms of mechanical properties. For example, in case of uh, polyethylene and uh, we have a commercial grade uh, of polyethylene called ultra high molecular weight polyethylene and these are used in fiber form where stretching is done so that all the macromolecules of polyethylene get aligned in the fiber direction, the stretch direction and look at the strength that polyethylene can get. Generally, we think of polyethylene as a material for grocery bags and, and where mechanical properties are not that significant. But look at one of the most strong fiber known graphite or glass fiber and aramid, which are strongest fibers known. In fact, polyethylene can reach similar strength. This is because along the fiber, all the molecules are organized. So, if this is the fiber, the macromolecules are all organized and you can see why there will be anisotropy of mechanical properties in such cases, because if you were to pull the polymer along this way, then the covalent bonds have to be broken if the sample has to be broken. But if I try to break the sample in this direction, then secondary bonds between macromolecules only need to be broken. So, orientation therefore, will necessarily always bring in anisotropy. And this is the anisotropy which can be also exploited in case of shrinkage or many other mechanical properties. And other example of uh, orientation is in case of an electroactive polymer, uh, polyvinylidene fluoride and this is uh, CH2, CF2. And because of this strong polar uh, group of CF, uh, when crystals are formed and uh, uh, one uh, type of uh, uh, morphology or one type of unit cell when it is formed then uh, we have all the possibility of the poles, the dipoles being arranged and oriented along one particular direction. And because of that orientation of dipoles, then when uh, current is applied to this sample, it deforms or when you deform it, current forms. So, therefore, orientation of crystal phase is uh, very important in this case. And uh, the phenomena of orienting the dipoles is called poling. So, we have in this case orientation of not only cha chains, but also dipoles themselves, 
which is important. So, in terms of how this is achieved uh, for practical applications, there are several ways and one of the most important factors which uh, processors talk about is the draw ratio. This is uh, the change in dimension when we are stretching. So, if I take a fiber and stretch it 100 times, then its draw ratio is 100. I have basically drawn it 100 times. So, you can see that for uh, ultra high molecular weight polyethylene, ratios, draw ratios can be 100 to 200. So, that is the amount of orientation and stretching that is being done to a sample to get the maximum mechanical properties. We can uh, do the stretching for sheets also based on roller. Uh, so, if I have let us say rollers and uh, they are uh, this one is rotating and then supplying uh, a polymer film to this and this one is rotating, but if the rotation rate of this is much more higher. So, that this film is this uh, this roller is rotating lot faster then what happens is this, this film will start getting stretched. And so, therefore, roller stretching is one of the common examples of introducing orientation in polymers. Uh, even in case of making bottles, so blow molding is a process in which case bottles are made and if you look at uh, a, a typical bottle shape, initially what happens is uh, a parison is uh, made uh, and uh, then uh, we blow air or other gas into it, so that this stretches and then there is a mold and this mold is actually the eventual bottle shape. So, then this polymer flows and then uh, it will come into contact with the mold surface and that is how uh, blow molding is done. Now, in addition to doing this blow molding, I can do stretch. What is implied by that? I can stretch the macromolecules in a particular direction first before doing the blowing. So, what is done at times is we take a plunger or a rod kind of a thing and we push that. So, that this parison will get stretched and I will just indicate that using the red. So, there will be a stretched parison and then blowing can happen. So, in all of these cases, it is the orientation which is being manipulated and it is a very practically sound way of making sure that certain parts of the bottle become stronger and which is what is desirable from an application point of view. Similarly, if we have a mold in which uh, injection molding is being done and there are short fibers, then uh, short fiber orientation during injection molding is also equally important. So, for example, if I have let us say a, a mold uh, opening and then the mold is there and then uh, polymer melt is coming in with all the fibers, then what you might end up seeing is some of the fibers being oriented this way while here fibers will be randomly oriented. So, if you look within the part itself, the way the flow happened of the polymer melt, the fiber orientation will be similar way. Now, the challenge in injection molding and orientation here is let us say if I want this particular corners to be stronger, but there the fiber orientation is random. So, clearly then this kind of mold flow is not appropriate. So, I will have to change my injection points or I will have to change the way the mold shape is so that I can achieve preferential orientation of fibers, so that maximum mechanical reinforcement can be obtained. So, therefore, what we have seen is orientation is practically very important in case of polymeric materials and from polymeric chain onwards to fillers and reinforcement orientation is important. And with this, uh, we will uh, close the lecture with a reminder that uh, some of these processing aspects that we mentioned we will be looking at much later uh, in course, where we look at many of these polymeric processing techniques and how we manipulate the status of macromolecular chains to obtain the best possible properties that we want. Also, the characterization of this orientation experimentally can be done by measuring refractive index for example. So, since the polymer chains are all uh, oriented in one direction, if I look at refractive index. And if I say refractive index in one direction as opposed to another direction, in fact, there is an anisotropy. So, this refractive index difference which is called birefringence is one common way to measure uh, orientation in polymers. So much uh, important this birefringence is 
that actually it is an indication of the state of stress in the polymer. Can you think of why? Why do I, why do I say that if I measure the birefringence, I can get to know what is the state of the stress during let us say flow of a polymer melt. And the key connecting point here is again the flexibility and rigidity of macromolecule. So, the more the stretching is, it implies that more the stress was applied in the flow direction so that macromolecule can stretch. More the stretch is, more will be the birefringence. So, therefore, stress gives you more orientation, more orientation gives you birefringence and therefore, birefringence can be connected back to stress. So, therefore, uh, this is something very important to note, the connection between uh, stress and birefringence and in fact, it is also referred to as stress optical law. So, you can read more about it to know this interesting aspect of how orientation can be directly used to get some information about state of stress in the material. And of course, given that uh, chain orientation and crystal orientation involves ordering, we can use scattering techniques also to do the measurement of orientation. So, with this uh, we will uh, stop here and uh, continue our discussion of uh, the structures of uh, macromolecular systems in the solid state.